not get any? Last week, or two weeks ago, we began to jump into Leviticus chapter 2, where we find the grain offering. And we found some really cool stuff about that. One thing you found out about me, I love bread. You know, I, I'll admit it. I am a carb guy. I choose restaurants for the free bread, whoever has the best free bread. And someone gave us a certificate to, uh, oh, wow, this really expensive restaurant in Newport Beach. Fleming's, yeah, that's what it was. And they had the best bread. The, that night, we uh, it was really good. I mean, I just... I got to tell you, how many of you ever grew up with a mom that baked fresh bread? Okay, tell me what you remember. We're small this morning. You can tell me. What about that aroma of the freshly baked bread? Did it just like make your mouth water and just, oh, there's something about it. And we will find this morning that this grain offering, this bread offering to God is a sweet aroma to him. Isn't that beautiful? That God appreciates these things. You ever wonder why God made all these spices for us to enjoy? All these different foods and all these things. I really believe it's kind of interesting. Do you know Christ is going to eat with us after the rapture at the marriage supper of the Lamb? And he's going to break a fast that he's been on for, wow, some 2,000 years now. What's he fasting from? Wine. Yeah, he said, I'm not going to drink it again till I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. That is a long fast. Can you imagine that? But he loves bread. He loves the aroma of bread. Certain smells can take you away and bring back memories. Did that ever happen to you? Like you smell it and all of a sudden you're back at your childhood at your grandma's house. What are the, oh, mothballs, that's right, (laughs) you know, it's like, whoa, that's, whew, all those smells. The Journal of Social Society, Psychology, please correct me, uh, Sophia, you know, I'm trying to say it right, published a study uh, that French researchers did, and they actually found out that the smell of freshly baked bread made strangers kinder to each other. Now, they did a full sociological study and actually found this out. So, all of you realtors, you're probably, some of your realtors, maybe they're, stop baking cookies when people come. Start baking bread. Something happens. The bread of life, that smell, it's so wonderful. Freshly baked bread, the smell of it is amazing. It's a soothing aroma to the Lord. In fact, throughout the Bible, it talks about breaking bread together. It's that idea of koinonia. What does that mean? Fellowship. That's communion. That's a mutual sharing with one another. It is this breaking of bread. And throughout the Bible, bread is important. It symbolizes joy and sustenance, nourishment, and fellowship. Bread was important in the Bible. Turn, if you would, to our text this morning, and we're only going to... Uh, Just dive into the first three verses. The rest of it you can read later, but we're going to cover exactly what this grain offering is. Leviticus chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says this. Now, when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. Notice the ingredients. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it, and he shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest. And they shall take from it his handful of its fine flour and its oil and all its frankincense, and the priest will offer it up in the smoke as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering of fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. And that word soothing means Uh, Kind of like if you take a Xanax today, what's that called when you get that calming, soothing? That's exactly what this word means in the Greek. They had Xanax back there. No, they didn't. I think they had something else. But (laughs) Verse 3, and the remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord of fire. I really want to talk about this grain offering. You see, the grain offering means so much more than just bringing bread to the tabernacle and giving half of it to the priest to burn in the altar and the other half to the priest so that they can eat and live. It's a sweet savor offering. It's all about Christ. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, it says, walk in love. What does it mean to walk in the Bible? 
live your life. It's your walk. It's who you are. It's not just what you do occasionally, but it's who you are all the time. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. In the grain offering, no animal was killed, no blood was shed. This was a free will offering of praise and thanksgiving to God. It consisted of flour, water, no leaven, oil, frankincense, and salt. You ever eat bread like that? Today it's kind of like pita bread. They didn't actually eat crackers at the Lord's Supper. Do you know that? It was more of this unleavened pita bread with oil on it, just like this. It was really an amazing thing. The ingredients simply are flour and grain, oil, frankincense, water, salt, and no yeast. And we talked about two weeks ago what all that meant. Grain represented the word of God. Remember the parable of the sower? They went out sowing seed, the grain. And what did that seed represent? The very word of God. It's nourishment for our souls. No leaven represents our sin is gone in Jesus Christ. By the blood of Christ, you are cleansed from all sin. Oil represents the Holy Spirit or our anointing and empowering and gifting. Frankincense, remember, represents our prayers. That sweet incense that goes up before the throne of God. And salt represented our new life in Christ. Yes, Christians, we should be the most spicy, flavorful, amazing people in the planet. How come we're not? How come sometimes Christians are the most boring? Uh, you know, it's like, what is wrong with you? Well, woe is me, brother. You know, it's like, I, you know, the blues came from Christians. I'm just telling you it did. No, seriously, it really did. It, it started out as Christian, you know, just singing their blues before the Lord. You know, boom, 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 I got the blues today. I'm at church and eh, whatever, <laughs> you know. I, dude, we need to, can we do some blues sometime, Mark? All right. You know, I didn't even have a zip fizz this morning. And I cut myself off from coffee early. I really did. This is powerful. To live physically, we need bread, right? We need water. We need sustenance. But to live spiritually, we need the bread of life. That's Christ. And the ingredients represent not just Jesus. Folks, it's not just, hey, I believe in Jesus, so I'm good. No, what are the ingredients? We need the word. We need faith. We need the empowering of the spirit. And we need to be people of prayer. Don't give God the silent treatment. He wants to hear from you. This results in our new life in Christ, the salt, and we become the spice of light. You know, you are the salt of the earth. Isn't that cool? You spice things up. You preserve it. You flavor it. Yeah, Christians, get spicy. We need to do it. Remember the bread in Exodus. In the tabernacle, what did we find out about the bread that was before the table of showbread? This bread that we're talking about now as the sacrifice and offering is different, the ingredients, than the bread on the table of showbread in the tabernacle. This bread was put in the holy place on the table of showbread. The bread on the table of showbread or his presence was made of fine flour, God's word. Okay, the bread in our chapter today, same thing, fine flour. What did that represent? God's word, right? Okay, <laughs> Baked into 12 loaves, which represented what? The 12 tribes of Israel. This is what's in the tabernacle or in the temple in the holy place as you approach the holy of holies. Arranged in two piles of six loaves each on the table of pure gold. Covered with frankincense. That's their prayers. And they prayed back then as well. But note this. There was no oil and no salt. You see, back then in the Old Testament, they did not have the gift of the Holy Spirit like we have today. Do you know that? In the Old Testament, when a prophet spoke, how did, what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon him, and he spoke. In the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit resides where? In us. 
It's mixed in us. And so this sacrificial loaf in Leviticus chapter 2, the oil was mixed in and poured on as well as the frankincense and the salt. What's missing? The oil and the salt. The Holy Spirit and our new life in Christ, the church. Isn't that interesting? So let's compare them really quick. The bread in the tabernacle is the bread of Israel. The bread in the grain offering is the bread of life. It points to Jesus Christ. Can you see the difference? Don't you love that God wrote this book and it all flows together so well? The bread represented God's presence and was not to be sacrificed in the tabernacle. It was the bread of his presence. However, the bread of the grain offering represents new life in Christ, and part of it was sacrificed, and guess what part? The first fruits, who is Christ. It reflected the bread of the tabernacle, the 12 tribes, and this new grain offering reflects the body of Christ, the church. The bread in the tabernacle had frankincense poured over it. The bread in the grain offering had oil mixed and frankincense poured all over it. The bread in the tabernacle had no salt. And of course, the grain offering had salt. Any grain could be used in the tabernacle bread, only the first fruits in the grain offering bread. So of note, Jesus is our first fruit, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then the oil that is in us now, because then it was only on them, John chapter 14, verse 16, Christ said, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it did not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you, old covenant, and will be in you, new covenant. Isn't that cool how the grain offering itself points to Christ and really is a picture of the church? Obviously, today we're going to be talking about communion. Of all the sacraments of your wood of the church and that we have the privilege to take part in, there is no more sacred thing than the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. Recognizing that Christ or Jesus is the bread of life. In fact, John chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread from God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Who's he talking about? himself. The grain or the bread offering points to Christ. John chapter 6 verse 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Truly, truly, I say to you, John six forty-seven, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You see, there's many, many different traditions when it comes to communion. We know it comes from what? The Passover meal, right? And it points back to the grain offering in the bread. Malachi chapter 1 verse 11 says, for from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure. Notice he only mentions the grain offering. Why? Could it be a reference that the sacrificial laws are now complete and there's going to be a pure bread of life offering, speaking of Christ? My name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. The blessing of the bread of life in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Is he talking about physically or spiritually? You know, we all have a, a, a spiritual hunger. And so many people try to fill it with money or drugs or alcohol or relationships or all these things, that hunger cannot be quenched and satisfied except in the Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life that quenches that hunger and thirst. 
our joy and contentment needs to come from the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, not anything else. People will fail you, but God will never fail you. You don't need drugs to have a good time. All you need is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem. What does it mean, you Hebrew scholars? House of bread. Christ was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. I believe that is so amazing that Jesus was born in the house of bread to satisfy our spiritual hunger. Folks, if you are discontent this morning in life, if there's something going on in your life and you are so discontent, I would encourage you, run to the Lord Jesus Christ and find your hunger satisfied there. This world will disappoint. The old saying, the grass is always greener on the other side is true. Do you, have you found it to be true, folks? Well, man, if we only had that car, then we'd be happy. You get that car, and a month later, it's like, uh, man, I shouldn't have got that car. <laughs> man, if we only had that house, we would be happy. If I only had that job, we'd be happy. You know, you can have the joy of the Lord no matter what state you're in. If you run to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, man, I know how to get along with much, and I know how to get along with little. What was his secret? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Why am I repeating that? Because that is where we need to find our satisfaction. Think about your favorite food. The anticipation of driving to that restaurant, thinking about your favorite food. You ever do that? Your mouth starts watering, and once you get there and you eat, ah, oh, the satisfaction. The Lord says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Oh, man, I want to satisfy that longing of your heart. One of our theme verses of living water is Isaiah chapter 55, starting at verse 1. That first word in the Hebrew literally is yeehaw, you cowboy Texans. You know, that, that literally, no, that's what it is. Yeehaw. I mean, it's oh, yeah, whoa. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. That's living water. Every other church, you're going to be, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's Jesus Christ, right? Oh, and you who have no money, I love this, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. I really love this verse. Because our pursuit in life, man, as long as we have food on our table, as long as we have health, and sometimes that fails us, but we can still eat and be satisfied, but spiritually satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what about communion? How does this relate to communion? Webster's definition of communion is the fellowship between persons, a state of giving and receiving. In the Greek, that's koinonia. It's a mutual sharing that takes place. Communion is important. There's three aspects to our partaking in the Lord's communion. Fellowship, giving, and receiving. Fellowship is communion when we have intimacy with God. Do you do that when you take communion? It, do you find that place where you are so joined with the Lord and you are partaking of Him that this fellowship is Intimate communion takes place. It's communing with him. It's a time of redevoting ourselves to him. And this year is, our theme is devotion. A year of devotion to the Lord. And it's a time of remembering that his blood cleanses us from all sin. And a time of receiving that forgiveness from sin. As I partake of communion and I put, as the cup, it's coming to my mouth. I say, Lord, cleanse me. Every cell, every memory, every thought, every ounce of who I am, may this blood wash me and cleanse me and make me white as snow. 
communion. It's not enough to admire Jesus. It's not enough to just come and listen. It's not enough just to believe. It's not enough to agree that he is the bread that's come down to heaven. You must eat of that bread. John chapter 6, verse 53, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. In the early church, we have a few extra biblical documents about the early church. You know one thing they were accused of being? Cannibals. Yeah, in this letter from a proconsul to the emperor, he, they were accused of being cannibals. Why? Because of this passage. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they would partake in communion together, and people outside were like, man, that is some wacky cult. Next verse, verse 58. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats of this bread will live forever. Jesus fulfilled all the sacrificial laws, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and even, yes, the grain offering or the bread offering in the old covenant it was a lamb a bull and unleavened bread in the new covenant guess what it was christ and when we partake of holy communion we point back to that sacrifice this is our sacrifice we no longer take a bull to the temple or a lamb christ is our passover lamb it's the blood and the unleavened bread. New covenant communion is when we recognize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood or the wine and the unleavened bread, Christ's body. In communion, we declare his death because we remember he is our sacrifice. Communion is the most sacred thing we are allowed to do as Christians. When you consider that, that is just not some liturgical sacrament that we are going to go through the motions, bless you, boom, ba, ba. Uh, no, this is an intimate communion with the Lord. It is something that is so important. All of this points to Jesus. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, the bread, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he doesn't do what? Judge the body rightly. Remember, the body is not your body. It is Christ's body, the unblemished lamb. That's the body that we judge Jesus is our unblemished sacrifice. So back then you would pick your best lamb from the flock. Oh, there he is, unblemished and perfect. And that would be a, a worthwhile sacrifice. Well, Christ is our unblemished lamb. We judge him rightly. 1 Peter 1.17 says, If you address the Father as one who impartially judges each according to his work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Our salvation is not based on what we do, but on what Jesus Christ did. 
Exodus 12, 5 says, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You had to judge the body of the sacrifice rightly for your sacrifice to be accepted by God. We point back to Christ and we say he indeed was the sinless, perfect man, fully man, fully God, who was sacrificed for me. So judging our body, the body rightly is saying that Jesus came in the flesh and was without sin unblemished. Now, during this time, Gnosticism started coming. What they say? Christ didn't come in the flesh. Guess what? When they took communion, they didn't judge the body rightly. Many of them probably were sick and died because they didn't judge the body of Christ rightly. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to what? To be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, not in your own good works, but in Christ. So let's look at how Christ established communion really quick. He did it during the Passover meal, and here's one of the gospels that records it, Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 17. Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover, the disciples asked, and they went to the upper room, if you remember, skipping down to verse 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread And after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So there's four cups in a Passover meal. We've done seders at this church. Every year we do one. Did one at Peter and Sophia's one time. And the first cup is the Kaddush, which means sanctification. With this cup, the Passover Seder, the meal begins, the first cup of wine. The second cup is the cup of plagues, where we remember it's because of the plagues that God delivered the children of Israel. The third cup is referred to as either the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing. And the fourth cup is called the Hallel, which means the praise for God's acceptance of his people. So the Passover observance, Jesus instituted his supper during the observation of Passover, and he took the bread right after the second cup of wine in the Passover meal. That's when they would break that bread. And remember the afakomei, that bread that they would break? And literally, it wasn't a cracker. It was unleavened bread, but it was the soft kind. And there was oil on it, and it was probably really good. In fact, today for communion, we're going to have that kind of bread. You know, talking about bread, I wanted to get us all a big piece and butter on it. and But, you know, yeah, all of that. We couldn't do that. So, Then the third cup is what is the cup where he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, the third cup. What about the fourth cup? Oh, no, remember? He said this, Matthew 26, 29, But I say to you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine, the fourth cup, from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. What's the fast Jesus is on? Wine. He's fasting from wine. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, Is that marriage supper of the Lamb? I love this. Let us rejoice, verse 7, and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. One day we're going to have, I believe, maybe, the last communion service ever, I I think we're going to do it at the communion, at at, at the marriage supper. Christ is going to break his fast, drink wine, probably break uh, all of that. So a new proclamation, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim what? The Lord's death until he comes. You ever wonder about that? Why doesn't say you remember his resurrection? You know, that's better. A, A lot of churches say, 
And in this communion service, we're, we're, we remember the resurrection. Well, we can remember the resurrected Lord, no doubt. But communion points back to the sacrifice. It's all about the sacrifice. You can't sacrifice for your own sins. You can't pay for your own sins. You can't do penance for your own sins. All you got to do is receive the free gift. Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross. Realizing also that Christ's death was part of the plan. It it, it to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Why do I bring that up? Because of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. What? Every false cult, every false religion, guess who their God is? Satan, the God of this world. Note this, I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And the Lord's Supper, communion, is partaking of the table of the Lord. As we partake, we share all the spiritual benefits that his blood provides. Throughout the Bible, there's many verses that talk about those benefits, and I don't have time to get in those right now, but 1 John 1, 7 and 9 says, If we walk in the light as he in himself, and then eat the bread in the cup, and how do we examine ourselves? Hey, I've heard a lot of people, yeah, meditation is one good way. But they say, if you have any sin in your life, have you ever heard this on Communion Sunday? You better repent of it before you take communion. Otherwise, you're going to get sick and die. <laughs> I've heard that. But here's how we examine ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we interpret Scripture with Scripture. What is it? Examine yourself to see what? Whether you're, you're in the faith. Here's how I examine myself before communion. Lord, forgive me, a wretched sinner. Lord, but I have faith in you. And you are the Son of God, creator of all things, sustainer of all things. And you were perfect, and you lived a life without sin, and you took upon yourself my sin. And I judged the body rightly. That's how I examine myself. What do we do? We look in a mirror and say, I am not worthy to receive communion. I'm not worthy to be called a son or daughter. I am a wretched sinner, but I have faith in the risen Lord. That's how we examine ourselves. Communion. So the Lord's Supper, it's actually a call to come to Jesus, to come and dine at the Lord's table. To come because he loves you and gave himself up for you. To come because even though you're not worthy, he is. To come and meet the risen Lord. To come and have fellowship with Jesus. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, I believe this is a reference to communion. Communion was all about dining. Remember the church of Corinth? What were they doing? Oh, they were eating to excess and drinking all the wine and getting drunk. And Paul said, listen, do your drinking at home. But when you come together for communion, just drink a little bit and wait for everyone to get there. Because you're drinking it all and then others come and they don't have any for them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and guess what? Have sweet fellowship, koinonia, dine communion with him and he with me. In fact, there's a song called Come Just As You Are. We're going to end with that and receive communion. Um, Pastor Chris uh, Fowler and Pastor Chris Brunt will be in the back to do the elements, and I forgot to tell you to go heat up the bread. <laughs> We're going to heat up the bread a little bit. We've got some olive oil on it. It's unleavened bread made probably just like the grain offering there. And uh, so during this song, uh, the bread will be up in probably 30 seconds. As your heart is prepared, go back, take a piece of bread, take wine. We have wine or we have grape juice, and they're labeled on, on the juices. Um, 
hold the elements, and we'll partake together at the end of this song. Amen? And I want you to know, 